Hey there, and welcome back to What Happens in the Woods. Y'all should know the drill by now. My name is Jessica, and along with my husband Bryce, we're the hosts of this true crime podcast. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Are you there? Yes. Okay, I good. Am here. After about an hour of technical difficulties, uh, we're we're sorry if you hear any popping where we couldn't figure it out. It just, yeah, it's frustrating. So, yeah, Apple. I, <laughs> I don't know what is going on, but I'm. Uh, we're not happy about uh, it. The pains of a podcast. Yeah. Uh, we're learning. We are, yeah. And, I mean, I know you want your roadcaster. Roadcaster. Mm. Just hit record. Sorry. Yeah. It, it's a little expensive. Okay. Well. You're used to disappointment by now, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, we hope everybody is doing good, not going too crazy, and you hope know. you're staying home and staying safe. Yeah, we just hope everybody's safe, and yeah, again, be kind. Um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to first say a little thank you to a podcast that we recently did, like a little collab with. Um, we kind of mentioned that on our last episode at the end. Um, they kindly let us plug our little podcast on one of their recent episodes and, you know, we hope you guys will continue to check them out. Um, so thank you to Bran at Moonshine Murder and Mayhem podcast. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Um, I've, I've joined like a little Facebook podcast group Yeah, and it's, it's kind of cool to see a lot of people that are getting into this kind of like we are and they're starting out and they're you know making connections and Mm -hmm. i don't know kind of little community going on i thought it was cool but um yeah so thanks to bran and then another quick woohoo moment Uh we recently hit over 250 downloads on the podcast so woohoo we um i mean i just want us to continue to grow but you know thanks for the support for listening Mm -hmm. and spreading the word Yes. I mean, there are countries that I don't know how they're getting us. Like, I don't know how they're finding us, but there are countries all over the world that we're seeing on our stats of people that are finding us and listening to the podcast. So it's pretty amazing. We're worldwide. (laughs) We are worldwide, except we haven't hit South America. It's all right. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. But I I don't know. Maybe it's because of language. I don't know. Maybe we could do in uh, Portuguese. I would If anyone love. wants to translate uh, this podcast into Portuguese, uh, feel free to hit uh, Jess up. Yeah, co- comment on something and, and let us happens. know if you can do that. I, what happens in the woods dot com? That would be amazing, actually, but I, I doubt it'll happen. But you never know; life is full of surprises. Mm-hmm. All right, so this episode, we're going back a few years on this case. So are you up for a little old-timey gore? Sure. (laughs) Yeah? Yeah. All right. So this episode, we're going to discuss convicted killer Richard Lawrence Marquette. Okay. Why do they always have three names? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, All right, well... Dick Marquette Mm -hmm. was a man who was convicted to life in prison two separate times for the same type of crime. Two separate times? Yeah. Once wasn't enough? Apparently not. No, it was not. They had him and shit happened and he did it again. Mm. So he had three different victims at two different, you know, time periods, Mm. but the same crime, the same conviction. That sounds just a little screwy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so not much is known about Richard's early years. I was trying. I was searching. I was looking everywhere I could about his childhood, about his life, you know, growing up mm-hmm. before the murders. There's just not much out there. So, you know, media being what it is now, of course, we're in everybody's business. Yeah. Back in the, you know, 60s-ish, we weren't. You you just didn't need to know about that. You didn't go look in the library at the microfiche? I, if the libraries were open right now to look at microfiche, <laughs> I for sure would have been there. And I just I wanted loved... to say microfiche. 
Microfiche. Microfiche. Uh, yeah, that would have been, I would have loved that actually. Yeah. If there's any a, a time that I can go and do that for this podcast, I sign me up. Okay. I will do it. Sounds a little boring, but okay. Well, that's why I do it. Oh. All right. Um, so what I did find out was that he was born in Portland, Oregon on December 12th, 1934. Mm-hmm. He was a high school dropout. And information that I found states that he was also an army veteran. I'm, I, I didn't know that you could be a high school dropout and go into the military. Uh, just like, you know, social media now, it probably wasn't as prevalent back then. Or even like records, you know? You know yeah, yeah. You could probably get away with saying whatever you wanted. There is really no way to check. That's true. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Um. So when he was uh, yeah. 21. The other thing, too, is they're, they're probably a little more relaxed. A little more laxed on the standards back then. Well, I mean, he it might have been because he was drafted. They might not have. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Know. They didn't care. They just needed bodies. This would have been right around the time of, it was after World War II. But it would have been maybe around the time of the Korean War or the Cuban Missile Crisis. Sure. And those were in the 50s, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So there isn't much information on like an early criminal career either. Um, When he was 21, there was an arrest made in 1956 for attempted rape, but the victim never pressed charges. So, of course, nothing happened. Where was this at? Uh, Oregon. Nope. And then in 1957, he used a bag full of wrenches to beat the shit out of a gas station worker in Portland in an attempt to rob it. So he didn't kill anybody. He, I don't think he made off with anything. They did find him. Mm-hmm. He was arrested. He pled guilty. And he served 12 months out of an 18-month sentence for the crime. So apparently he was a model prisoner and he was released early for good behavior. How long was that sentence? Uh, 18 months. Oh, wow. And he served a year of it for beating the crap out of a guy with a bag full of wrenches. A bag full of spanners. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, they're heavy. You could do some damage with just one. I can't imagine a bag, you know. But the guy, he he lived. He didn't die, so... Yeah. I had a friend that used to say that. What? He was English, and he'd say, you have a face like a busted bag of spanners. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? Anyway, just when you that said that he beat him with sense. a bag full of wrenches, it's the same thing. He just, I was like, okay. I guess it must be an English thing. Forgive me. I'm not trying to make fun. I just, to my American brain, it didn't make sense. So. Why wouldn't you just say, guy's ugly? It just seems like a mouthful to say somebody doesn't look very pleasant. <laughs> I don't you're an the, ugly SOB. Yeah, well. I guess. The English, they have their They have local quirky slang. little things. Yeah. yeah. Like Bob's your uncle. I don't, right. I don't have an uncle. I, yeah, I've never had a Bob anyway, that was an uncle. Shout yeah. out to Chris. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> oh, the funny things that we learn. Yeah. So, okay, so he gets out, you know, early on good behavior. Mm -hmm. He makes his way back to Portland, and from there, we move forward about three years to where his crimes really get sick. All right. All right, so, like I said, there was three victims that he confessed to killing, but with the severity of his crimes and how far out they are spaced, I just really wondered what else he may have done. Yeah, because nobody just goes straight to that. Right. Like horrible crime. There's always an escalation. You always see, you know, like when we talked about um, the Green River Killer, it wasn't, he didn't go straight there. It was, it was, you know, progressive. And right. More and more and more. Like there's that line and he, you know, killers always cross that line. So, yeah. Especially right. in that day and age, they may not have connected the dots and the police work may not have been up to snuff, but, or up to par. So he could have. There could have been things he wasn't connected with, yeah. Well, exactly. Especially in three years. Right. And I, the one of them, one of these, and I'll get to that at the end, he, I mean, he confesses to it, but nobody even, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. But yeah, that exactly what you said. 
I don't know how you go from like attempted rape and robbery mm-hmm. um, to like brutally killing women. Yeah. I just, I was like, there's got to be a step in between. There's just, there's something that's missed. Mm-hmm. We'll never know. Um, all right. So the first victim was 23 year old Joan Cottle. And she was married. She had two children. Mm -hmm. In June of 1961, she's reported missing by her husband when she doesn't come home. She had gone out shopping. He, (laughs) this poor guy is just, he's a, I can't. Um, So she supposedly went out shopping for Father's Day Mm -hmm. for a present. Um, He's looked at pretty thoroughly as the main suspect of her disappearance, but there's, there's no evidence. The husband or? The husband. Okay. Um, he states, again, she went out Father's Day shopping for him and she just never showed up at home. He is really no help. He doesn't know much about her daily habits and he, he can't even really, um, give any personal identifying distinctions of her. So, Jeez. yeah. So a few days later, I mean, they suspect it's him. They don't have any evidence at all, period. So they can't charge him with anything. He's just kind of this poor schmuck. A few days later, they get a phone call, police do, Mm -hmm. from a local woman who tells them her dog brought her home a severed human foot wrapped in a paper bag. Awesome. Can you imagine making that phone call? Or can you imagine getting that paper bag? Right. Like, hey, Skosko, what do you got there? (laughs) Right. What what the hell is this? (laughs) Right. I no. have a little Yorkie. His name is Roscoe, and he, something he would do. I mean, he he w- would love to bring us home anything that we thought would be interesting. I yeah. just imagine him, you know, padding up to you and be like, "Here, Dad." Oh. Yeah. Um, I, it's it's. I laugh, but I mean, honestly, it's it's horrifying. Yeah. Um. All right. So she calls the police. They they show up. They find that the um, the foot is completely drained of all fluids. There is no blood. Mm-hmm. While they're there, the dog brings in sev- a severed hand. The while the police are there, yeah. Oh, okay. So same thing. It's completely drained of blood. Mm-hmm. There's no blood. Um, a search of the area brings them to a box with some more body parts yeah. propped up alongside somebody's garage nearby. Okay. Right. So yeah, this, I'm going to I'm going to pause. It's funny because these detectives suck so bad a dog had to do their job. Well, it was just I mean, they're there questioning her and then the dog is just like, "Well, here you go. I brought you the one. Yeah. It's it's a big hit. Let me go find another." Yeah. Um I don't know that it sucks that they weren't doing their job, but it just kind of was like I don't know, it's serendipitous, I guess. Mm, you know. Yes. Um so Here's why I want to pause for a sec. I don't know how you drain a body part of its blood. Like, the amount of time that it would take to drain different body parts, wouldn't you think that would be a process? Uh, I'm not well versed in this. No, I I'm know. I'm not going to speak I on just, that. It, I don't <laughs> understand it. I'm, I, don't I know. want desperately to know how the hell that happens. I just. I want to know so badly, and I think that makes me a little sick, right? Yeah, no, I mean... I'm a little off. I mean, you do it in hunting. Like, you drain the blood, but I mean, I've never done it to a human. I can't speak on that. Yeah. Yeah, I just... It, I'm I'm having a hard time with it, because I want to understand, mm. I guess. Um... So yeah, I, please forgive me if if that sounds disgusting. I these are the things that I think. So I I want to know more. We'll reserve judgment on you. <laughs> well, you're my husband. You have to love me no matter what. So I'm speaking for the audience. Oh, okay. Now you're. 